Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. My name is Wade Nomura and today we're going to be taking a look at how Rotary trains its future leaders. Each year Rotary changes its leadership all the way from the club level up internationally. And with us today we have uh, two special, three special guests, two uh, president-elects that will be serving and the chairman that was in charge of training these two people. Janice Sugiyama with the Rotary Club of Carpenter Morning. Welcome, Janice. Thank you. Chris Baxter, President-Elect for the Rotary Club of Santa Barbara Sunrise. Hello. And uh, Rich Delacqua, who was the chairman of the 2016 Pets Seminars. Thank you, Rich, for coming. You're very welcome. By the way, how far was it that you had to drive today? About uh, four hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> four so. hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> so. Traffic? A little bit here we, and there. We tried not right. to have that happen for yeah. you. My apologies to T that. Typical Southern California. So. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with you, Janice. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Doesn't that be Rotary? Just we want to hear a little bit about you. Well, I'm a general dentist. I practice with my husband. We've been in the Carpinteria area f for almost 30 years. We raised our daughter here, and she went to Bishop. <clears throat> and uh, currently, um, I still volunteer with the California Dental Association. We're going to be putting on a, a big free dental clinic in Ventura on April 16th, 17th. <laughs> and um, I'm also involved with a, a community picnic, for the Japanese community picnic, and just a variety of things. Plus, I do my rotary things. <laughs> and I've been doing it since 2002. Very good. Thank you. Chris, how about you? Well, we'll go back a little bit uh, further. Uh, I was born in uh, Colorado. Uh, my father's a uh, veterinarian. I was uh, born out there while he was still going to school. And uh, when he finished, he started his practice in uh, Downey, California. So I grew up in the uh, LA area. And, uh, but moved to Santa Barbara in 93. So I've been here for a few years. And I uh, came to Santa Barbara uh, to work in the uh, infrared industry. Started working for uh, Santa Barbara Research uh, years ago and uh, cut my teeth and uh, eventually uh, started my uh, own company in partnership with two other great uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, we developed that uh, business uh, producing uh, advanced infrared sensors, camera systems, image processors, and uh, later sold the uh, business to uh, Teledyne Scientific and Imaging. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, currently uh, consulting um, in the uh, industry and uh, getting much more involved in uh, Rotary. And uh, when the uh, Past presidents of my club uh, found that I was uh, uh, transitioning out of my uh, business. They quickly <laughs> jumped on me and asked me to become uh, president of our club, which is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. So, uh, um, enjoying the process. Great, great. Thank you. Rich, how about you? Yes, I could go back a little bit further than Chris. Uh, <laughs> I was born uh, almost 75 years ago. And uh, Chris men mentioned cutting teeth and Janice uh, is a dentist. I'm a retired orthodontist, so <laughs> retired about uh, 14, 15 years ago, and uh, we moved to Southern California at that time. We, my professional uh, practice was up in Livermore, California, oh. okay, so uh, I was involved with Rotary since 1985. I was a charter member of the Tracy Sunrise Club, and that was my initiation into Rotary, and uh, at that time what caught my fancy was the beginning of the uh, Polio Plus program. Because uh, when I was in Tracy, we had uh, Joe Serra, the orthopedic surgeon, came and gave our club a presentation of his uh, stab techniques that he was doing in Africa. So in the back of my mind, uh, at that time, being that the uh, Rotary was starting Polio Plus, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So that really stuck with me. And I've been in Rotary at four different clubs because of moving, so probably a total of 27 or 28 years wow. now. Mm -hmm. So being that the, we, my wife and I are retired, we really have uh, taken Rotary as part of our life. So it's given, given us a lot of satisfaction and a lot of happiness too in doing our Rotary project, so. Very true, okay. very true. Uh, Rich, tell us a little bit about what we call PETS. What does PETS stand for and what, what is the event? I, I remember um, a uh, past RI director from Mexico, uh, he had something on the internet uh, that he was associated, associated with PETS. And so some of his uh, friends thought he was working for a dog food company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so PETS is a President Elect's Training Session or Seminar. And uh, I, I do enjoy history. Uh, it's always nice to know where we came from. 
and what has progressed. And interestingly enough, in 1977, there was really no organized curriculum or method of training incoming president-elects. So during that period of time, an incoming district governor named uh, Jim Vanderberg had the idea, being that uh, Rotary is so important to deliver the service that the clubs provide, why aren't our president-elects trained to be more effective in delivering that mission? So he came up with the idea of having a president-elects training and in the meantime, uh, five of his fellow incoming district governors uh, thought it was a great idea. So instead of each district trying to create their own pets training, those six individuals got together and created our president-elect's training program. So at the time, it wasn't uh, popular with Rotary International. It took uh, over 12 years for Rotary International to accept it as the exceptional way of training president-elects. So uh, Jim Vanderberg realized that the president-elects was the most important office in Rotary because of the uh, ability to develop the service that Rotary is uh, known for. So this all came to being in 1978. The first pets worldwide was in Newport Beach. So that was the beginning of pets and what I didn't realize was that it was a multi-district pets was the first pets that was ever given. I was always under the impression that each district did a pets and then they finally got together and formed a multi-district pets, but that's not true. So the first pets ever given in the world was multi-district pets because of Jim Vandenberg's uh, inspiration. And since then, uh, being that our Rotary International has accepted that as the best way of training president-elects, about 90% of all the president-elects in the United States are trained in a multi-district pets. So there are actually over 20 multi-district pets in the United States. And what has evolved from that is what we call the Pets Alliance. So every year at Evanston at the RI headquarters, uh, leaderships from all those 20 different multi-district pets get together and discuss the best business practice and how to solve some of the problems so that they could be more effective in training the president-elect. So pets has come a long ways and we have to thank uh, Jim Vanderberg for the insight of forming the very first pets, which was multi-district. Very good, thank you. Um, at the Southern California Nevada Pets, which is the one that you chaired right. over, how many uh, clubs were actually represented? Do you know roughhand? We had about 350. Okay, uh, it was about uh, 10 or so from outside of Southern California. So total about 350. So wow. 340 from Southern California and Southern Nevada. So we call it Southern California slash Nevada. And the slash Nevada is Southern Nevada, the uh, Las Vegas and Henderson area. Right, right. Oh, very good. Total <coughs> attendance was... Uh, a little over 600? Yeah, total attendance, uh, counting all the uh, governor <coughs> lines and the district staff and, and the partners and spouses was over 600, correct? Okay, right. great. Well, well, thank you. Janice, we're going to jump to you and uh, ask you, what did you think about the pets uh, experience? Was it something you anticipated, you knew about, or was it something that was uh, a little different from what you anticipated? Well, it was a little different, perhaps, but my husband was a president 20 years ago, so... Um, we had gone to the L.A. Marriott again for his pets, but, uh, you know, they certainly took advantage of the technology available, and we had uh, our own, like, app on our phone so we could find things we needed, and certainly a lot of dialogue before and after the pets. So I think it was a very well-run meeting and, you know, better than I thought. Good, good. Good, thank you. How about you, Chris? Your experience? <laughs> I thought that uh, PETS was outstanding. Um, PETS with the president's elect uh, coming from all different uh, areas, uh, they also have different levels of Rotary experience. I've been a Rotarian since 2001 and uh, have served in a number of different roles, have served um, on international trips, working closely with other Rotarians and so forth. And so I've got a uh, I think a broader perspective of Rotary than uh, some Rotarians have. Uh, perhaps their experience is primarily even focused within their own club or within a very near region. 
Uh, PETS is an opportunity to come together with Rotarians from all different areas, a great opportunity to uh, network, uh, build new friendships, uh, resources to help you throughout your uh, coming year. Uh, I thought the training was uh, fantastic. It catered to the, um, I think, the needs of all the president-elects in preparing them to take over leadership of their, of their uh, club. It was um, a lot of uh, sessions uh, training, uh, helping us to become better leaders once we step in, but it was also a lot of fellowship and a lot of great uh, entertainment uh, and inspiring speakers. Great, great, thank you. Rich, uh, tell us a little bit about the curriculum. How is that developed? What makes you select specific items, topics, things like that? Well, one thing uh, we're working within the confines of what Rotary International mandates, mm -hmm. so there's a certain number of things that we do have to cover. But uh, the PETS experience itself is not long enough to cover everything. So our district governor elects are the ones that choose which courses uh, they would like to see taught at PETS. And the courses that are not taught at PETS that are mandated by RI are actually taught at the district level at a what we call a prep session, either half a day or full day, it used to be called pre-PETS. <laughs> so that kind of fills in the gap of what we can't cover mm. at the uh, actual pet seminar itself. Yeah, so the district governor elects are the ones that select uh, the courses that are to be taught at pets. So the unique thing about pets is that it's really under direction of the district governor elects because it's their district president elects yeah. that are doing, uh, having the training. So they give us direction and the pets committee itself, uh, our charge is to deliver what the president elects uh, what they uh, think that uh, their president <laughs> elects <we> should <laughs> be trained. So, so it, it's a, uh, a wonderful way of the PETS <coughs> committee not taking control over what the president, uh, the, what the district governor elects mm -hmm. uh, really want. So, uh, I remember at one of my PETS alliance meetings, uh, there were some district governor elects that were very upset because their multi district PETS really didn't allow them to have the input that they wish they would have had. And it's actually RI mandates that the district governor elects are the ones that uh, really control the program, what courses are being given, and even to the point of who the keynote speakers are. Great, oh, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. As far as uh, curriculum, what specific uh, topic uh, did you actually have takeaway from? Is there something that jumped out that you didn't know about that you were brought familiar with in that process? Janice? I can't recall, really. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, being a senior mem senior Rotarian, I was always struck by the fact that some of our president-elects are relatively new. And so when I would mention things that I think we all are familiar with, they, they kind of looked at me like, what, what? <laughs> so, um, no, I, I mean, I think I uh, like to listen to the other president-elects and hear their situation. Certainly we are not all identical. The clubs vary in size, location, they vary in the types of problems they're facing and uh, that I found very, very interesting. Good. Thank you. How about you, Chris? Well, Rotary uh, today is really focused on uh, bringing in uh, younger, vibrant members and uh, there were some sessions talking about attracting younger members to uh, Rotary. What is attractive to them? And uh, I know that a number of Rotary clubs uh, are, are working hard to uh, grow their uh, memberships and so forth, and they're a tremendous resource. So I think that uh, sitting in on a panel where one of the uh, panelists had attended the, uh, the uh, Berkeley uh, Youth Session, I don't know the uh, title of that, but uh, to have an opportunity to speak uh, with him uh, afterwards, uh, some very uh, pointed questions. There, I think young people have a real interest. I think Rotary has a lot of uh, value for uh, young people that are looking for um, networking opportunities, uh, building good friendships with not just people within their age groups but across a uh, broader uh, age group. Uh, and then uh, also too, uh, the opportunity for mentorship. How many, how many opportunities does a young professional have to meet such a broad range of people in various professions, develop a friendship and potentially a mentoring uh, relationship? I think that there's tremendous value there. 
And the other facet is that a lot of young people really want to uh, contribute to their community, and Rotary is a perfect organization to do that. And so uh, really looking to uh, spread that message and uh, really present uh, the value of Rotary to young people. Good. Now from that, did uh, you come up with a plan on how you plan to bring in these type of members, something as far as a strategy? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, and we're already implementing uh, measures to, to attract, and I won't say just focused on young members, but all members. I think a healthy club is a Rotary Club <laughs> that uh, represents um, various ages, you know, from top to bottom, if you will. And, but with regard to focus on the uh, younger uh, population, it's really uh, reaching out to, to uh, our networks, uh, we've already been successful in, in attracting uh, younger members, but uh, also um, through Rotary's uh, Interact and Rotaract, those are perfect pipelines for young people to uh, learn about Rotary, get involved at a young age in terms of service projects, uh, develop relationships, assuming there's strong connections between the Interact, Rotaract, and the Rotary Club, where it's a natural transition as, as they get uh, older. And with regard to attracting um, um, uh, just the general public who has an interest in uh, service and uh, fellowship, we had a very successful uh, mixer at the uh, Santa Barbara Club uh, recently, and that's where our club mm -hmm. meets every uh, Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. It's an outstanding facility with an outstanding uh, staff. Uh, it was well organized and uh, well attended. And so uh, as a result of that already, we're, uh, we're um, We've had uh, a number of prospective members showing strong interest, and some of those are transitioning into uh, members in our club. Great, thank you. How about you, Janice? Any plans on gaining members? Is there a plan you have put in place for membership increases? Well, we always believe that programs bring in good members, and we always try to line up a good program uh, for the year. Um, but we're taking a little step back this year and trying to um, make our members good Rotarians. And in order to do that, we have to, uh, you know, maybe present programs that talk about Rotary a little bit more instead of just bringing them in and then they have to figure it out on their own. Other, other things we're trying to do is to increase fellowship, so that would mean letting the new members find out about the old members and the things they've worked on and the things they've seen. It's kind of hard in an hour, which is what we have from 7 True. to 8 on a Wednesday morning. But... Um, in order to go forward, I believe the members we currently have need to be a little better up, up to snuff, and that will uh, also help bring in new members. So we're sort of in a building mode, <laughs> um, and it's a lot of work. Uh, however, I think you know the payoff will be the members we have will be better members, and they should be able to attract even more dedicated Rotarians uh -huh. into the club. Great. Thank you. Now you're from Carpinteria. That's a pretty small area. I Do practice you, in Carpinteria. And, I'm and not you from, practice. <laughs> I'm not from Carpinteria. But you practice, uh, right? As as is the club. Have you found that to be a challenge having a smaller community, or has that actually benefited uh, the club itself? I think club culture always, you know, is the attracting point. We we had the other club, which is my husband's club, for many years, and it was a noon club. But as time, you know, times progressed. The younger members or the business people wanted a, a, a morning club. And so when we chartered our club, it was a morning club. And that instantly brought in a certain group of people who um, wanted that type of club. I mean, I know that up in San Inez or Los Olivos, they have like a cocktail club. And right. it, just, it just depends on the culture of the community. So even in a small town like Carpinteria, there's enough room for two clubs. And God knows, we might even have three if things don't work out. But <laughs> That's not for prime time. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Rich, uh, organizing the Pets Committee and trying to create the curriculum must take a lot of time. When do you actually start the planning? Uh, at least a year prior. Mm. Uh, and you probably started a year and a half prior. <laughs> but yeah, it takes a, a full year to yeah. plan almost uh, monthly meetings and a lot of emails back and forth in between the meetings. So. Uh, we have an excellent committee, and there's a lot of continuity from year to year on the committee. So it's a, uh, the best committee I've ever had to work with in my Rotary career. So, Great. Yeah, it's yeah, been wonderful. But uh, both Janice and Chris brought up, too, an important uh, 
uh, comments, and one is about uh, there's many young president-elects, and there are some president-elects that had years and years of rotary experience. So it's difficult to create a curriculum mm -hmm. that satisfies everybody. But in our pets, we have Friday morning of electives. So that's kind of able to fill in the uh, kind of the blank spots that uh, maybe a, a young new president-elect might have, so he could get a little more insight into where he feels he's lacking. And uh, Chris mentioned uh, a lot of uh, uh, networking. So a lot of our required courses, we have it as a small group discussion where there's probably uh, 25 or less people right. in the room and it's all interactive where everybody shares their ideas. So I think uh, more learning is done in that small group discussion than in a large uh, type of a lecture environment. Mm -hmm. True, very true. Right. And, um, Southern California and Nevada Pets also encourages spouses to attend. Which exactly, is, uh, and uh, we're fortunate in that our facility is large enough to do that. Right. There are some multi-district pets that uh, their facilities are too small, and they mm -hmm. exclude uh, spouses and partners, which is a shame because it's important for the uh, spouses and partners to realize uh, the enormity of Rotary and what Rotary does, so that they could actually become a part of it also. Actually, the next closest one to us actually does that, where they don't allow spouses right. to go, and right. they also, because of the limited size, have the uh, president-elects share rooms. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's kind of... Yeah. <laughs> Make, yeah. makes it uh, interesting and a different experience, I'm sure. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, we were the first pets in the whole world, and uh, we had the honor this year of having the manager of the Rotary International Resource and Learning Division come and visit us, mm -hmm. because uh, she heard so much about the success of our pets. And uh, her division is actually responsible for creating the President-Elect's uh, manual, and also a pets manual. Mm -hmm. So ours was only the second uh, pet she's ever attended. And uh, it was an honor for us to have her. Great, great, outstanding. Chris, back to you. What did you have as a takeaway? What was the number one thing that really jumped out at you as far as the pet's experience? Well, I think that it was a number of things. I don't know that I can point to uh, just one. I think that it was, uh, because I have been a member of Rotary for a number of years, I have a lot of um, information and experiences under my belt. but. Uh, to attend the, the pets, it was extremely well organized and I was able to take away a number of different uh, nuggets that will help me in my uh, leadership uh, organization. But I, I think that perhaps really what it is, is the real emphasis on making sure that president-elects have the training that they need to be successful once they, uh, once they uh, find themselves uh, leading their, their clubs. Uh, that commitment of Rotary to ensure that that training is provided, I think, is is a tremendous message to to uh, all Rotarians. Great, thank you. How about you, Janice? Well, I always thought the most important thing was meeting Chris there at the, <laughs> at the I mean, meeting the fellow president-elects right. from Group Eight was important because now, Group Eight is uh, it's the eight clubs in Santa Barbara Carpinteria. Oh, okay. okay. And um, they actually do their own thing too, which I don't understand. But the Group 8 um, president-elects will continue to meet monthly and uh, we will be able to support each other by knowing what each club is doing and uh, assist them. And so I think that was a great asset of uh, the pets. We got to meet and then you know, take that forward um, into the future. So kind of creating a network then uh, Correct. support. Correct, yeah. Oh, nice. After all, who else knows what we do but another president-elect, mm -hmm. right? Very, very true. Yeah. Now, um, Janice, for you, what made you decide to become a president? Oh, you ask all the hard questions. Only to you. Um, <laughs> well, It'd be easier for Chris. Uh, <laughs> well, it, you know, I, you know uh, being club president is an honor. However, it, it is a very time-consuming job. When I... Uh, when we chartered uh, uh, the club, I assisted Charter President Joe Lazaro, and uh, pretty much did, uh, you know, learned a, a lot of what goes on. And as the years went on, there were some good presidents and some not so good presidents, you know. And so, um, it's really not a job I sought, but because we are Rotarians, and when we see that there's a need, we try to, you know. Uh, help our club by serving in that capacity. Great. Thank you. How about you, Chris? 
why did I want to become president? Um, well, I know I was on the short list for a while, and so uh, <laughs> when I transitioned, uh, that's when they uh, struck. Uh, but no, I, I did. I, I wanted to become uh, president of the club. We have an outstanding uh, club. I've been a member long enough that I know they're all my friends, and uh, it's, I think, an honor to to lead the club and uh, continue in the success that uh, Rotary Club of Santa Barbara Sunrise has, has enjoyed over the years. Uh, there's always challenges that uh, come up, and uh, you know I'm looking forward to to uh, tackling that with my board and, and including all the uh, membership so that we uh, grow in, in uh, fellowship and strengthen the uh, projects that we work on that really have a uh, profound impact on our local community and, and internationally. Great. Thank you. So as a president, what do you think about a one-year term? Did you find that kind of unusual? Do you think one year is plenty or not enough time? Well, I think given the fact that uh, there's uh, everybody has a lot of commitments in life uh, to carve out the time uh, to serve as president um, in, in an uh, effective way, uh, one year is probably about as much as uh, most people can, can uh, consider. Anything beyond that, I think uh, you're going to have uh, fewer takers, and it's just going to be a real challenge. Anything shorter than that, I think, would be difficult to implement um, initiatives that that particular president, that particular club, might want to undertake under that leadership. Great, thank you. How about you, Janice? Well, I think given we we have sort of a line of succession, we have our president-elect nominee, our president-elect, and our president, and in an ideal world, that would be a developing model so that by the time you become president, uh, you're equipped to handle the job. I think it, it, for some people, unfortunately, being president is a learning experience on the job, and then when it's completed, they regret not doing certain things, and they want to do it again. But it's a one-shot deal, and so I think one year is sufficient. And Rich, real quickly, but uh, knowing that it's a one-year commitment for the presidents, how much emphasis do you put on that curriculum, just being that one specific Well, that, that's what makes brief. it so important. Uh, in addition to the fact that the club president is the most important uh, position in Rotary. And uh, you'll find this going to be your most gratifying year that you will spend in Rotary as being the club president. So I congratulate you both for taking up the challenge, and I'm sure you're going to be very successful and you're going to be very gratified with the year. Well, very good. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, joining us. And by the way, good luck on your upcoming years. I'm sure they're going to be very successful. You especially, Janice, since you're going to be my president. Uh, <laughs> well, you better be good. She's got to work it out for her. <laughs> and for you, Rich, also, for your time and commitment. Well, Thanks for that long drive. We sure appreciate yeah, it. You're very welcome. And with that, next time, um, hopefully, you can stop by, take a look at some of these clubs, and see how the next year's presidents will be doing. I'm sure they'll do an outstanding job. And with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.